Good morning. Uh, I want to welcome Rabbi Russ Resnick with us this morning. He is a veteran rabbi, teacher, counselor, writer, and currently serving as uh, rabbinic counsel of the unit, Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations. He is the rabbi to the rabbis, and he's a, been a very dear friend of uh, Rabbi Rubens for many years. Um, if you would like to come on now, uh, Rabbi Russ, and you can tell us a little more about yourself and give us your message. All right. Thank you, Lisa. I should be on. Yes, Am I coming are. through okay? Yes, yes, you are. Good to see you. All right. Um, well, it's really a blessing to be with all of you, and uh, I'm coming in from, I was going to say, I usually say sunny New Mexico, but we're having a morning of Maryland weather uh, today. But uh, I bring you greetings from Albuquerque. And uh, I've known Rabbi Barry for many years, and I've gotten to know uh, Lisa as well. And, uh, but I don't, know, I don't know most of you, and I'd really like to tell a little bit of my story to, uh, to kind of introduce myself, because I, I think I'll be involved part of the UMJC support community as Rabbi Barry is recovering and uh, returning to his uh, his ministry and his work. If you could, you take down that slide, and that'll get a better uh, better screen of me. Not that I'm uh, eager to show off my face, but I, I feel like maybe I can connect even more with you. You know, if I'm on camera. Um, so I'd like to share some of my story this morning as background. Um, so that you know who I am and, and uh, a little bit more of what you are connected to as a congregation through your connection with the union, through, with the wider Messianic Jewish community. community. And uh, as happens on so many mornings, a great way to start the story is to go back to the parasha briefly, which we just read. It uh, begins as Rabbi Foreman uh, mentioned by Yitzay Yaakov mi Be'er Shava, by Yelech Harana. And, and Jacob went forth, Jacob went out from Beersheba, Beersheba um, to go to Haran. And like Jacob, as a young man, I took off, I went out um, from uh, the land of my birth and headed to a, a new land. New Mexico, not Haran, but New Mexico, which back in those days was kind of a uh, hippie Mecca. I had grew up in Southern California and uh, dropped out. I went to uh, University of California, dropped out in the middle of the, the process, like so many young people did in those days. And uh, after a year or two, New Mexico, which was remote, which was open, which had uh, open land where people could just come in and settle down and try to grow crops, uh, that beckoned to me. And so I took off, like Jacob, I didn't have uh, much with me, but uh, settled in in New Mexico. And soon I met my wife-to-be, Jane, who was already there. And uh, we, we uh, in the next couple of years, few years, we had two little boys. But we also, in that time, found the limits of our hippie vision. Um, we, we were really utopian. You know, we thought we were, we were gonna escape the corruption of the wider culture and create this new order of uh, peace and brotherhood and uh, harmony with nature. And we gave it a shot, but we found the same greed, the same uh, competitiveness, the same violence that we were escaping permeated life out in the uh, remote mountain mountains and mesas of New Mexico among the hippies. One day, my, uh, my buddy and I were digging a root cellar, a place to store our uh, potatoes and other winter crops. This was in September, I think early September. Um, maybe August, toward the end of the growing season, and we were digging in, uh, our root cellar, and one of our neighbors came up and told us that a friend of ours named Mel 
had been shot and killed. He had picked up a hitchhiker and uh, was trying to help the man. And uh, one morning when, Mel, when Mel's back was turned, the man grabbed his rifle, Mel's rifle, and shot him, killed him, stole his, uh, his Jeep, and ran off. And this, uh, in addition to the grief over our friend, it really shattered our utopian vision. And we wondered uh, what it was about, what we were doing, where we were heading. At Mel's funeral, one of our friends invited uh, Jane to go down to uh, their commune, which was at a lower elevation and closer to the city, and she could uh, harvest some uh, crops for the winter, pick up some supplies. And so Jane went down with our two little boys who uh, promptly got sick and uh, she was kind of stranded. The, the hippies who preached love and uh, brotherhood and sisterhood really didn't help her much at all. And uh, she was stuck and the days wore on and finally uh, a friend of ours offered to bring Jane to a place to, that she could hitchhike the hundred miles back up into the mountains where we lived. Uh, the friend couldn't take her herself, but she could bring her to a good hitchhiking spot. And on the way there, Jane prayed that, uh, you know, God, whoever that was, would just get her home again. And they pulled up to the hitchhike spot, and there uh, was this big converted Greyhound bus that was idling by the side of the road. And on the side of the bus, it said Jesus one way. It was, a, uh, it was a Greyhound bus that had converted to be a Jesus bus. This was in the early 70s. In fact, uh, yeah, the early 70s. So uh, the bus was filled with what we, in those days we called Jesus freaks. And to make uh, this part of the long story a little shorter, they, uh, Jane, they had prayed. Uh, they were from New Jersey, and God had, had directed them to... Uh, the mountains of northern New Mexico to study the Bible for a year out in the out in the mountains, and uh, they had laid hands on their bus that anybody who set foot, anyone who got into the bus, would get saved before they got off. And uh, Jane came on the bus. They bombarded her with scriptures, but they were helpful. They were positive. There was something real with them. And uh, before she got off the bus, she went into the back, and. Uh, invited Jesus into her heart, as they had urged her to do. So when Jane got home, um, she, she told us about it. And I don't remember saying this, but when she told us about Jesus, we didn't say Yeshua yet. Um, I said, well, that's far out, because I'd been starting to read and look into the New Testament a little bit. And uh, a little later, Jane invited a couple of the guys from the bus to our house for dinner. And, and uh, after dinner, over the kerosene lamp, we lived in a very remote area where we had no utilities, no electricity, no gas, no running water, or plumbing, lived a primitive lifestyle. So we were sitting there by a kerosene lamp, and they were uh, opening scriptures to us. And they said, uh, do you want to have the the Spirit of God living inside of you. And we said, yeah, that's, that's really what we're doing up here. You know, we're looking for God. And uh, they shared that if we would uh, believe in our hearts that God raised Yeshua from the dead and confess with our mouth that Yeshua is Lord, that we would be saved, we'd be brought to, to God, and God would fill us with his Spirit. And uh, I believed it. You know, this was the, the, the surprise to me. I'd kind of been looking at the New Testament, looking at Yeshua, but uh, from a distance. And that night, there was an undeniable encounter, an undeniable reality. And I knew what they were saying was true. Um, I couldn't say the words, Jesus is Lord, because in my nice, uh, polite, Southern California Jewish household, we didn't, we didn't say Jesus, period, let alone Jesus is Lord. But, but that was the night that things began to change and um, from there there was no turning back the other uh, amazing thing that happened that night though was that it 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 uh, from that time on it began, it mattered to me again that i was jewish you know uh, i i had always been jewish but i kind of left that behind in in ways or at least i thought i did and became kind of a hippie universal person. And we were into Zen and Vedanta and Native American religions. And uh, 
you know, believing in, in Jesus was pretty low on the list of spiritual uh, pursuits. But, uh, but I, it, that undeniable encounter changed it all. And at the same time, being Jewish, which was also low on the list, uh, all of a sudden really mattered and was really important. And we struggled for quite a long time to, you know, what to do with Jesus plus Jewish or Jewish plus Jesus. And finally, <clears throat> I met uh, Eliezer Urbach, who some of you may know, uh, Rabbi Barry and Lisa certainly know or knew Eliezer of blessed memory. And he encouraged me to return to our people. He was a, uh, uh, a very early Messianic Jewish pioneer who had uh, survived the Holocaust by serving in the Russian army during World War II and uh, made his way to Israel, served in the Israeli army in the War of Independence and became a believer in Yeshua in the 50s. And he said to me one day, uh, Russell, with one tuchus, you can't dance at two weddings. In other words, you have to choose. You have to decide, are you going to raise your children as Jews who believe in Yeshua or um, as Christians who happen to be Jewish? You have to decide. And, and for me, the, the Jewish calling um, was very strong and very clear. And uh, that led into involvement in... Uh, this new movement of Messianic Jewish congregations, which um, was rising up in those days. We're now in the early 80s. And uh, Eliezer sent, sent me to a conference of a new organization called the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations, which uh, was built on the idea that to, to really serve Yeshua as, as Jewish people, we needed Jewish congregations where we, we can sustain our traditions and our customs and uh, raise our children up as Jews. So the UMJC, uh, the message there was it's not just that it's okay to believe in, G in Jesus and be Jewish, uh, but rather that Jesus, Yeshua, is at the heart of what it really means to be Jewish. And that living a visibly connected Jewish life as a follower of Yeshua is a prophetic calling. And for me, this was a second great turning point. Um, and I've been walking it out ever since, helping to build and uh, encourage and strengthen Jewish congregations for Yeshua, who is the Messiah of Israel. So this uh, second great turning point uh, leads me back in my mind to the turning point of our parasha. So let's go back there, parashat by say, and uh, the beginning of the story, Jacob left Beersheba. I'm, I'm confusing the Hebrew of the years. Jacob left Be Beersheba and went to Haran. And he came to a certain place and he stayed there that night because the sun had set. I mean, taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, he saw a ladder resting upon the earth with its head reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending upon that ladder. And behold, the Lord stood above it. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The, the place on which you are lying, I will give to you and to your offspring. And in your offspring, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And you will multiply. I will multiply your offspring like, like the dust. And you will spread forth to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And behold, I will be with you, the Lord said, as you go to Haran, and I will surely bring you back, and I will stay with you until I have fulfilled all that I have promised you. And Jacob woke up from his sleep. He said, surely Adonai is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid. And he said, how awesome is this place. 
This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Now, the word uh, place here in the opening uh, verse, or really the second verse, uh, appears three times. It's, it's the word makom in Hebrew, and it's really like uh, one of the characters of this story. It appears here three times in the in uh, the second verse of the story, the second line, makom, and then three more times toward the end. And this place, in the end of the story, Jacob or Yaakov is going to mark it with a stone marker, a little pillar, and anoint it with oil and name it and call it Bethel, the house of God. But at the beginning, it's just a place. In fact, Yaakov stops there uh, because the sun went down. It's not, a, it's not his destination. He didn't have it in mind, but he, um, he encounters it, as Rabbi Foreman brought out. It's kind of an unusual word. And I think it's uh, part of what's going on is that the, the place is, um, is any place and every place at this point of the story. It's the place that is made fearsome and made awesome by God's initiative, the place of divine encounter. And I would add, it's a place of divine encounter that changes everything. This is the beginning of, of Jacob's spiritual transformative journey. And uh, like my encounter, our encounter with Yeshua, the, the place, you know, we were in the middle of our lives trying to do our ordinary uh, lives. I mean, it didn't look that ordinary. It was kind of trying to resurrect the uh, 19th century in the middle of 20th century America. But, you know, we were just doing our, our normal thing and we had an, an undeniable encounter with Yeshua. That was the place. And it, it is in great contrast with idolatry. As Rabbi Foreman pointed out, there's a, a contrast between the, the ladder, the vision of the ladder, and the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel. Because the Tower of Babel is man-made, and the place of divine encounter is God-made. It's a contrast with idolatry, with worshiping the work uh, of our hands versus uh, worshiping the one who created us, worshiping what we create instead of worshiping the one who creates us. And that, that uh, contest between idolatry and the worship of the one true God runs throughout Scripture. It's a dominant theme in, in Tanakh and on into the, uh, the New Covenant Scriptures. But it's not just, uh, you know, ancient history. I think that we still have this struggle today. Will we worship? Will, will our ultimate loyalty be to uh, man-made um, realities? Or will it be to the, the God who is beyond, the God who is uh, beyond our making, our naming, our uh, domesticating? And we live, uh, I think, more than ever in human history in a, in a man-made world. Many people are cut off from, from nature, from the, the signs of God's creation. We surround ourselves with what we can make. And the God of Israel is the God who breaks through all of that, who uh, initiates an encounter with us, as he did with Yaakov, as he did with me and with Jane and with our friends, God initiated and God revealed himself. And so, so Jacob says, this is the gate of heaven, heaven coming to earth, heaven opened up and revealing itself. And that's something that, that man-made religion, man-made uh, technologies, man-made ideologies cannot accomplish opening heaven, the, the presence of the creator, the presence of God into the midst of his people. So heaven is coming to earth. And as uh, I, I agree with Rabbi Foreman, uh, the understanding that Jacob is, uh, the latter is kind of a symbol for Jacob and a symbol for his people as they worship the God of heaven and serve him. We, Israel, become a bridge between heaven and earth. The, the, the uh, fulfilling of commandments, the fulfilling of God's word, 
brings heavenly realities uh, onto the earth. And Rabbi Foreman mentioned uh, two other scriptures that reinforce that idea. But I'll uh, add a third from the Besorah, the Gospel of John, which we read briefly as part of our uh, Haftor, or New Covenant reading for today. Uh, it's at the end of the first chapter of John, and uh, we're in Galilee with Yeshua. Philip is a Messianic Jew in Galilee, follower of Yeshua, and he starts telling his friend Nathaniel about Yeshua the Nazarene and his miracles and his prophetic acts, and could he be the Messiah? And Nathaniel uh, responds with the famous line, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And uh, Philip says, well, let's go see. You know, I'll come and show you. Come with me. And they, they head out to, uh, to find Yeshua, to meet Yeshua. Yeshua sees them coming. And as Nathaniel comes close, he says, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And Nathaniel is taken aback. How do you know who I am or what, what I am, anything about me? And Yeshua says, well, before you uh, headed here, when you were still talking with Philip under the fig tree, I saw you and knew you. And Nathaniel is blown away, to use the terminology of our old days in the mountains. Nathaniel's blown away, and he says, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And Yeshua says, you're saying that because I, I told you I saw you when you were under the fig tree? Truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, echoing the, the very words of this parashah, the very words of Jacob's vision when he saw the ladder ascending to heaven or, or uh, resting, resting upon the earth with its head in the heavens and the angels of God ascending and descending on the ladder. Yeshua says, uh, you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending upon me, upon the Son of Man. So Yeshua is saying he himself is that ladder. He is the connecting one between heaven and earth. He is the one who opens the heavens and brings the reality of heaven uh, to earth. And he walks among us and is manifest among us. He walks and uh, is still walking. He was out uh, decades ago in the far reaches of northern New Mexico, finding us as wandering Jewish hippies. And he gathered us in. He opened heaven for us. And he's done that, I know, for, for many of you who are uh, listening and watching as we worship together this morning. But I don't believe that Yeshua uh, and, or that John is presenting this, this Midrash of Yeshua is to say that Yeshua replaces Israel. I think Rabbi Foreman is right that the latter is Israel and Yeshua is presenting himself as a one man Israel, as, as the one Israelite who fulfills uh, all of the purpose for Israel, but he doesn't replace Israel. He doesn't say, you know, I am, I am the, uh, the latter, and therefore you don't have to worry about it anymore. We can see in his teaching throughout the Besorah, the gospel, that he's calling us to follow him, to emulate him, to reflect who he is, to, uh, in a sense, be that latter with a small L, uh, as we follow and embrace our, and are in union with Yeshua, the ladder, the, with the big L. So Israel is still that connecting ladder. Um, Yeshua, as one man, Israel fulfills that connection, is the bridge between heaven and earth, and he calls us as his followers to emulate him, to, to be a bridge between heaven and earth through obedience, through reflecting the goodness and the mercy and uh, the glory of God through Messiah. So I'll leave you with uh, just a word of uh, <clears throat> exhortation, a takeaway word. Really, it's a double word. It's, it's uh, two parts. One is, that, is for us to be alert to the awesome 
presence of God. Jacob stumbles upon a place and discovers God in that place. God reveals himself to Jacob in that place. And it's a very special place in the end. He names it, marks it, but in the beginning, it's sort of an anonymous place. It's the place where we live day by day. And through the Spirit, God is still breaking in to our places today. And the message for us is to be alert, to be aware, to be um, eager for that encounter with the living God. The living God is, is the true God in contrast with the idols of man-made worship, man-made technology and ideology that uh, surround us that are not living gods, but the living God is real and lives in contrast to that. So let's be alert to the living God and to his presence. And as we encounter him or as he encounters us and reveals himself to us, be alert to openings to, to represent him, to really stand for God and represent God and be uh, in Yeshua, in Messiah, as he bridges heaven and earth. Thank you, and Shabbat Shalom. Oh, thank you so much, Russ. That was beautiful, and it was a real pleasure.